I found that picture in the web, and I thought, wow. This is Word of the Lord from Ephesians 6, 16 and 17. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Mm. So good. Let me read that one more time. Ephesians 6, 16 and 17. This is from King James Version. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, truly, Lord, let these words come alive in our spirit today, that they will not live a life of regret, but, Father, that will just truly live a full life for your kingdom's sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title of my message today is Christianity is Aggressive. Christianity is Aggressive. I'm not talking about this crazy, violent, you know, taking the capital kind of aggression. That's the imbecile Christianity. I'm talking about reasonable, intellectual, and yet holistic with your passion. That you could really say someday, no grant. That's the English term that I'm trying to put up on Oxford Dictionary right now. You know what no grant is, right? No regret. No regret. Yeah, I, I came up with that. <laughs> so, if someone uh, says that no regret, no. Uh, oh, you mean Pastor Holt's term. So I'm actually writing a book called Life of No Regret. Would you tell your neighbor, no regret, man. No regret. <laughs> the word says, when you put the full armor of God, this helmet of salvation, the belt of truth, shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, based on the scripture, is your Christian life primarily offensive or defensive? Think about that. Because we do not understand that we spend too much time in defense. So when people, the world think about Christians, they are just full of people defending their faith. When we Christian at first was known as Protestant, who protest, who go forward, aggressive. So when we think about helmet, yeah, I guess helmet, you could take it up and kill somebody with it. <laughs> But primarily helmet is for defense, protection. What about the shield? Right? I guess you could kill someone with the shield, but it's primarily designed for what? Defense. What about the sword? Hmm. Never think about that. See, if you're too much into kung fu movie, <laughs> or one of my favorite kung fu movies is the hero. Have you watched that hero? Oh my goodness. You know, the guy kind of stays in the midair. <laughs> <laughs> and they're shooting 100,000 arrows. And this guy, instead of taking shield, takes the sword out. I'm like, huh? You know? <laughs> and arrows are coming. <laughs> like, wow! It's, it's something to remember. Like, wow! You know, I think about it. Like, but that's not what the sword are primarily meant to do. It's not for protection. I'm like, why didn't you just take two shields, you know? You know, <laughs> you don't have to do any movement. <laughs> because the Bible talks about this shield that King David writes about in Psalm 3, 3. But thou, O Lord, are my shield around me, my glory, and the lifter of my mind. Wow, powerful imagery. See, King David was being chased by his own son, Absalom. And when kings in olden days entered the battle, he will have an army 
full of the large shields because the most scary weapon in those days was arrow. And when king approached the distance where the enemy could shoot arrow, the, all these soldiers would surround him with this humongous shield and put it on all around. And King David says, my son is chasing me to kill me. But God, you are shield around me. Every battle I entered, I was protected by the shield. And God, you alone are shield around me. So shields are important and we need it, but it is not meant to attack. The Bible says that put on the full armor of God, man. And what? Take the sword and start swinging. Not for protection, but to offend. Offense. Offense. It's almost like imagery is like, you know, you go to jungle and you have this knife that it's just weeds, it's just branches. And yet too many of us spend entire life just defending, defending, defending our faith. You know, when you see movie Lord of the Ring. It's just a bunch of people at Shire talking about the good old days or war that's happening in the other side. Talk about their war heroes and, and minute details of the battles and how they debate over, no, that's not how he killed him and nonsense. We are supposed to be in that fighting the battle because he says, put on the full armor of God, full armor of God. Today's message, I... It's, so loaded, I'm thinking, until this morning, I'm like, Lord, I don't know how to handle all these ingredients, you know, and actually while we're praying, <laughs> the intercessors were praying, I'm like, it just kind of clicked. Ah, that's what you want me to do. See, have you, you know what sukiyaki is, right? I hope you know what sukiyaki is. This is predominantly Asian, so you probably have sukiyaki. Uh, there are two kinds of people in the world. One who tasted my wife's sukiyaki and those who didn't. <laughs> oh, she's a fantastic cook. So when she does this, and you know the difference between sukiyaki and shabu shabu, right? Some of you are like, really? There's a difference? Oh, yeah. <laughs> sukiyaki is already cooked in the pot. Shabu shabu simply means in Japanese the sound of the vegetable cooking. That's why shabu shabu. You didn't know that, so I'm telling you right now. <laughs> so shabu shabu, you choose. You dip. And, but sukiyaki is all cooked. So I almost feel like Jenny cooking up spiritual sukiyaki so that you could choose, pick. But the bottom line is that you need to answer this question. Are you aggressively, offensively pursuing your call? That's the that's the primary question. See, when, when we have sukiyaki from Jenny, I, I always, let's just call it suki suki because there's no, nothing yucky about your sukiyaki. <laughs> so, fantastic suki suki, you know. So, whatever ingredient I'm dumping here that you choose, so the end of the day, that you could tell your children, your grandchildren, I led a life of no regret. There's no regret in my life because I've done everything that God asked me to do. Faithfully, fervently, passionately. Although it seemed impossible, I just did it. And I give God the glory. You see, I've been quite emotional last, couple, last week because I said goodbye to one of my spiritual mentors who profoundly challenged me. Ever since 86, I met him. He was a church planter. His name is David Kwangshin Kim. He planted a church called Grace Community Church. And his church exploded from like four people to 2,500 in like three years. And so he started renting the school. And 1986, I was a Fuller Theological Seminary student. And, and I was taking this legendary class by C. Peter Wagner, Chuck Kraft, and uh, none other than a uh, founder of Vineyard, John Wimber. Most controversial class at Fuller, 1986. It was a class on healing and work of the Holy Spirit. While I was taking the class, I was given an assignment to go check out 
the church and see how they grow and how the Holy Spirit operates. 1986, I was 25. And I, I encountered him. Oh, he was a gracious man. You know, if you grow from four to 2,500 in three, four years, then they are going to call you cult. <laughs> so that's what they were called, cult. is in Korean community, Christian community. I think they are a cult. How can they grow so fast? A lot of jealousy, a lot of pointing fingers. And so I remember at age 25, I was asked to do a revival meeting at a college department there. And I did not want to go to a cult, <laughs> to a revival meeting. I don't want to bless call people, you know, so <laughs> I want to make sure that this guy is not called. So I remember knocking on his office at 4, in the, 4 p.m. and revival was at 7. And I sat down and said, I mean, just, I was 25, man. I look young now. Can you imagine? <laughs> this 25-year-old man or punk <laughs> sat down and said, sir, I would like to ask you a question. <laughs> How does one get saved, sir? I was challenging his salvation, theory of salvation, or theology of salvation, theology of Holy Spirit, theology of his doctrine on demonology, because that's what he got into trouble with. He just comes out clean, squeaky clean. And then I've known him, and he's been mentoring me. And... But the moment that really changed my life, from being a local pastor to just whatever Lord tells me I'm going to do. It's 1997. 1997, uh, Pastor David took us to four countries or five countries in Europe, or in, in the, uh, the Stan area, Tajikistan, Kijikistan, Belarus, Russia. And I remember 97, we landed, or we landed in Russia, we took a train, long trans-Siberian train, and very long, and then we landed and we drove into this village in Belarus. When we landed in Belarus, can you put up the next? And I don't know if you could see that. Well, Belarus is above Ukraine. But well, Ukraine used to be part of the USSR, 1997. Right? So USSR, or actually before that, I'm sorry, 10 years prior. What happened was that the Chernobyl blew up 10 years prior to 97. Chernobyl nuclear reactor blew up. You know that, right? It blew up and it went up two miles. The ashes went up two miles up. And the wind blew and dumped all these ashes, mostly in Belarus. So when you see that dark area, that means everything in it died. Everything in it died. You know what Russian government said? 32 people died <laughs> initially. We drove through the highways over there. And when you drive through those highways, guess what? On, out of nowhere, they put up this huge wall. You cannot see into the village. I said, what are those walls? I said, oh. You cannot go there. I said, why? Everything beyond that point died. 32 villages and towns disappeared. Everything died. So you cannot enter there. And you see the orange right there? Dark orange? You cannot enter there the next 200 years. Because the dirt, earth is contaminated. Well, <laughs> after we go to this village, show the map and say, oh yeah, we're in this hard, dark orange area. I'm like, really? You didn't tell us about it? Why? You know, Pastor Kim is so, it's like, we need to be here. We need to bless these people. Wow. Just, there's nothing defensive about his faith. If the Lord tells us, we go. See, prior to this, we were at a country called Tajikistan, and we are passing out Bible and sharing the gospel. And, and after we came back and said, oh, by the way, you know that they could legally kill you on the spot by Sharia law. It's a Muslim country. Really? How come you didn't tell us? <laughs> it's like, well, thanks a lot. I said, this is dark orange area, you cannot enter for the next 200 years, but you know that Bible student that you, hire, you train, yes sir? Or, or day train, so not me, they, they, they train in Moscow. His name is Vladimir, he's Belarusian. Knowing that that land is cursed, he came and planted a church. 
the village of 450 people. Why? Although the government said you could get out, oh, where are they going to go to? Where are they going to go to? That's the only thing they have. Knowing that this, you cannot get anything out of the ground, there are 450 people living in the village. And as we're attending this ceremony of sending Vladimir to other parts of the city and the new pastors are coming in, the village of 450 people, 450 people attended. They have 100% Christian, they convert to Christianity. And you know, the village people are giving testimony that, you know, when government was leaving, all the high official rich people were leaving because they have other means. But us poor people have no place to go. Destitute. And we remain, and then we found this young couple coming in, sharing the gospel. How can we not believe what he says? When government re abandoned us, he came and told us the good news. Wow, powerful, powerful stuff, man. And the land is so contaminated, now everybody's dying of cancer. Now the four-year-olds contracting blood cancer. Four-year-olds should not have blood cancer. You know, silly me, me and Jenny, you're there too, right? You're there? Oh, I was there. You're there, yes. <laughs> we have to talk about food, and then she makes the, ah, oh, yes, I ate there. <laughs> I remember sharing a banquet, and then they said, oh, this is a vegetable, this is, this is a salad. I'm thinking, turn off the light, see if it glows. You know, I just, <laughs> just want to make sure that I'm not going to, you know, what really moved me was that this Vladimir planted a church and after he converted the entire village said, this is not right that we stay here and just kumbaya our way and then we're going to go to heaven. Hey, there are other villages. So two by two, they would send missionaries to other villages. Doing that method, they now conquer 10 or 12 villages all around and every village is 100% Christian. And he said that my work is done here, I need to go move on. And then he found out he was fourth stage cancer. Vladimir had no hope. And so he invited this young couple to replace him. And then he says, a few weeks ago, Lord appeared to me, Jesus appeared to my dream. And, and Jesus said, oh no, you're not coming home yet. You have more works to be done. And he woke up, went to hospital, four stage cancer, completely gone. And he said, Lord, thank you. I'll continue to serve you. No regret. No regret. I'll be aggressively, offensively pursue my calling. And then they invited younger couple into their village. And, and what really got to me was I was sitting right next to this young couple, just married, no kids, and looking at them, mid-20s, and I'm looking, are you crazy guys? Are you kidding me? You really gonna come here knowing that you may give a birth to a deformed child? Knowing that you too may die of cancer? I got all choked up. Ah, you know, 97, I was 36, and it just didn't make any sense to me. I was too, in a way, saturated with this prosperity gospel of America at the time. Like, you have to grow, you need to grow, you need to have the biggest church, and, and rah, 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 rah. I remember Belarus don't have hotels. They just rented some kind of school building, and Pastor David Kim was sleeping in the other room and I got up early to use the restroom or something and I had to go to this public bathroom, you know, and, and as I was walking four in the morning, I heard Pastor David Kim already up, just pouring his heart, pouring his heart to the Lord and heaven and said, God, would you save this nation? Would you bring good news to this nation? God, would you raise up leaders that could preach the gospel in this nation? I'm thinking, Pastor Kim, you have several thousand member church in Fullerton. You don't have to do this. Why are you doing this, Lord? Pastor, and, and, and I realized it was his calling. And he was not backing down. 
He was not going to say, well, I just kind of, uh, I got 4,000 member church. You know, we're already giving 50% of our income to the mission field, and he's known as the man, and it's like, no, he's just on the field doing the things God has called. No regret. You know, uh, the morning devotion I've been use, using, Kierkegaard's book, doing my morning devotion and this Christian discourse, he writes the following. And this is where the title is coming from. The Christian cause is indeed of no defense. It is not served by any defense. It is aggressive. To defend it, it is all misrepresentation of the most inexcusable. It is unconscious, crafty, treachery. Wow, strong words. And then he writes, Christianity is aggressive. He wrote that at age 35, at Copenhagen, 1848. 1848, at age 35, he wrote this tremendous thing against Christianity that was setting in Denmark because Danish accepted Lutheranism as theirs and said, sola fide, only by faith. You don't have to do anything. You could do whatever. You were born as a Christian. You're going to die as a Christian. All of the Danish people go to heaven. And at age 23, said, hell no. <laughs> they start writing at age 35 against the norm, against the state church, against the churches that was paid and pastors paid by the government. He says, no, you got it all wrong. I, I believe that when we talk about our faith, that we need to be more aggressive and start swinging the sword of the Spirit and see how far you can go instead of just like, you know, okay, come on, arrow, come on. I know Kung Fu, you know. The people that really excite me are the people who not only watch other people doing, but doing something with their faith. Amen? If the earth has Netflix, they got heavenly flicks. In heaven, no, really. And because they got different quality of time, you could sit and watch your entire life in a heavenly flicks. And imagine what percentage of that is you watching, you talking about someone else's faith. And what percentage is you actually doing something about your faith. Live out existentially. I love the term existentialism because I'm an existentialist since 26. I started reading Kierkegaard. I said, man, I want to live like him. I want to live like him. I don't want to talk about theology. I want to be theology. I don't want to talk about philosophy. I want to be a philosopher. I don't want to teach philosophy. I want to teach them to live out their philosophy that they're willing to die for. You know, one of the most profound existentialists, he's not even Christian, his name is Akira Kurosawa. How many of you watched Seven Samurai? Wow, good. Just a few of you though, that's kind of surprised. How many of you watched seven times? I mean, after all, seven samurai. Oh, not two. There are two kinds of people in the world. <laughs> who watched seven samurai seven times, and who didn't. And all of you didn't. So let me challenge you. If you cannot ever eat Jenny Suki Suki, then at least you could watch seven samurai seven times. But when you watch, ask the following question. Why are they doing what they are doing? There are many characters. There are seven of them. <laughs> seven samurai. <laughs> but watch it and say, I want to look at it from the director's perspective. I want to watch from the main character's perspective. I want to watch from the farmer's perspective. I want to watch from the bandit's perspective. It's about bandit raiding the village. And the farmers eventually rise up to be samurai. And, and, and it's a wonderful story. Beautiful story. You know, Akira Kurosawa was born 1910. By 1954, at age 44, he made this movie. I said, mind boggling. The fact that he made this movie in 1954. It's amazing. And the, the, the story is about 
this seven samurai enter the village and the village people says, please protect us from bandits. They come seasonally when harvest time comes. They come and raid, kill, take all our food and take all our women and, and please help us protect us. And there's the, the hero within Seven Samurai. This is one, he was a farmer, he was born as a farmer, but he goes up the rank and becomes samurai. Beautiful story, man. And in the protection of it, they are so there samurais and they're training these farmers and, and they will come through this route and we put the trap and all that. And then one day, the head samurai says, the greatest defense is offense. Let's go raid their village. <laughs> Let's go raid the bandits' village. And you know, you should have seen the farmer six. <gasps> no, that's not what we're supposed to do. It almost feels like Christians today. Oh no, that's not what we're supposed to do. We need to defend our faith. We cannot go to the enemy territory swinging our sword. We need to just keep our faith. Samurai said, no. You get sword, you got spear. <laughs> when we raid middle of the night, we have a chance. So let's illuminate the enemy at its source. Wow, it's incredible. So actually all the farmers, they train and they go. Middle of the night, they invade. Fire everywhere, screaming and killing. And, 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 and the beautiful section in this story is, there's this Japanese lady who was abducted or kidnapped in the prior invasion and, and her husband I mean the fire's going let me set the stage for you the fire is going and, and this beautiful lady walks runs out and then the eyes meet her husband her husband is oh, you got done all. You know, and, and she looks and she's in love. You know, we got 650 muscles in our body. The face, 230. You could, you could, you could say so much with your face. And look. You know, like, she said, I love you. No, she didn't say that. I'm just making this up. Even in Japanese, I love you. And, and her husband said, I find you. And then the camera zooms in and she looks at and she's pregnant with the enemy's child, the bandit's child. And she looks up again, their eyes meet, and she turns around, jump into the fire, burning eyes. And her husband goes, ah! Wow. That's powerful. See, Akira Kurosawa was an existentialist. He read Kierkegaard, and he wanted to make sure that he represent reality of war. And he was intricate work of just showing how real battle is, how real this was. And, and, and I, I just cannot believe that without any computer graphic, he was able to, the 1954, right? Is your faith that authentic? See, Kurosawa was criticized so heavily, and he was only 44 when he did that, and his budget was out of the world, and people start calling him names, and he says he's crazy, he's maniac, there's no way we could afford this kind of movie, and, and yet he said, well, I don't want it then. There's a scene where that in the winter, they're in the horse, and they actually catch a wild boar. It took the entire step to live to the mountain, and they spent two months just filming that 30 seconds. <laughs> you know, if you ask him, do you regret any of it? There's no regret. I did everything I needed to do as a filmmaker. That when he turned 83, that Steven Spielberg and Lucas, they all respect him, and he wanted to do a thing called Dream, six segment of dreams that he had as a child. And they just gave me money. I said, just, sir, just go ahead and do it. We respect you so much. But they were so influenced by Kurosawa when, you, when they were young. Life of no regret. I mean, a guy who doesn't even know Jesus could live a life like that. And I'm asking you a question. 
What keeps you from doing the things that God has called you to do? Why aren't we aggressively pursuing our calling? And, and some people said, that, well, because I don't know what a calling is. Well then, stop everything. Find that out first. If you don't know what your calling is in your life, then you are living someone else's dream right now. Find out. Fast and pray. Fast seven days. It, it won't kill you. It feels like you're going to die, but <laughs> <laughs> honestly, you won't die. Passionately pursue. Ask God for the calling in your life. And then once find out, well, live it to the fullest. And don't have, you know, people say, oh, but I don't have money. I'm like, God, you're living in the richest nation in the world. And if you make money an issue for pers not pursuing your, then there's no country in the world. Don't make money an issue. You cannot serve and money at the same time. Mammon, which means confidence. Don't put money, resource, as your God. That's just an idol. If God tells you to do something, just go for it. Just swing. Okay. Let's see if I can make next step. See, years ago, Lord started calling me to, now I want you to go to Oxford and get your second PhD. I said, no, why? Why? I don't, I don't want to study again. But Lord said it. I said, well, Lord, if it's your will, it's your bill. <laughs> you pay for it. As long as you pay for it, I'll do it. But you need to do something. Step out. You need to apply, you need to register, you got to know how much you owe. See, I found out that I need $10,000 because I bought the ticket, I now need to go to Oxford, I need $10,000 by Saturday because that's how I'll be flying into Oxford. Without that, I cannot continue my education. But I register, I apply, got in, and now I need $10,000. I said, Lord, I need $10,000, make it happen. Well, then I get invited to Georgia by my spiritual father. Another spiritual father said, son, come, you buy your, you, you pay for your own ticket, you pay for your hotel, but do three lectures for me. I'm like, oh gosh, you know. But I prayed about it. Lord said, you, you obey. So I said, okay, sir, I'm going to go to Georgia and I'll check in, I'll buy my ticket, I'll pay for air hotel, and now three lectures for you, free of charge. And I let my friends in Georgia know that, hey, I'll be in Georgia, man. And one of my good friends said, oh, if you're in Georgia, why don't you come one day early and preach for our church? I said, oh, that sounds great. You see, that's the church that I visited 2007, riding my motorcycle across America for 30 days, 29 days. You know, and I raised $140,000 to send 35 pastor's kids, Cambodian pastor's kids through a four-year college. So I said, oh, sure, Georgia sounds great. And I remember preaching to this church. And, you know, at the com completion, my friend comes up and says, you know what, guys? Why don't, why don't we give him some love offering? Wow. I love pastors like that, you know. I think, I think, I think they really hear from the Lord, you know. And so $6,000 comes in on the spot. I'm like, wow, it's not even a big church. So I got $6,000 check. Monday lecture, Tuesday lecture, Wednesday lecture, Wednesday morning. And I said, but Lord, in a few days, I need $10,000. And it was a holiday. There was like 1,000 people conference. And there were at least four, 500 people at Holiday Inn, large Holiday Inn, Georgia. And so breakfast, you know, breakfast buffet. So I'm, I got my plate. I'm ready to, so excited to eat my breakfast. And there are a lot of people, but there are a lot of empty, empty uh, tables. And the Holy Spirit basically said like this, Ch -ch 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 -ch, sit there. I said, hmm, okay, there are other people, but there's four seater, two people are already there. So I just said, I said, hi, my name is, oh, we know who you are, we heard your lecture, oh, thank you. And one bad missionary from Japan, one missionary from uh, Puerto Rico. And at the completion of breakfast, this guy, missionary from Puerto Rico said, Pastor o, this is wild, but Lord's been bothering me all week to give this to you and pull out a check. For guess how much? Or the wisdom. You guys know this. <laughs> Did you hear my testimony before? Wow. He had a check for $4,000 and giving it to me. Does it, do you need this? I said, yes. 
<laughs> start swinging. Start moving forward. Don't say the circumstances are right. Don't say, you know, it's not. No, it's just, it's like weeds. You cut. You got the sword. Sword of the Spirit. Use word of the Lord. And I, I really think the really key word today is breakthrough. Breakthrough. And I'm going to invite Jenny up uh, real soon. And if you have a keyboardist to minister to us, I really want us to have a breakthrough today. Amen? No regret, guys. No regret. Don't ever say at the end of your life, said, I wish I'd done this more. Or I wish I had more resources so I could have done that. Or I wish that I... No. Please, let this be the last day. There will be a breakthrough in your life. Just like that image that you saw. Wow, the shield and the sword is swinging, man. And it's going somewhere. And I, I pray that the Holy Spirit, God, will come and manifest, that put things in order, empower you to move, start moving toward your faith aggressively, offensively pursuing the calling in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Jenny, why don't you come up? Why don't we go to the Lord in prayer? Church gave me 35 minutes to preach. I just did 36 of it. <laughs> but we spent a few, few minutes in, in prayer. I, I just want Jenny to intercede and, and pray with you. I really want you to break through. Life is too short to live a whole life and say, you know, I wish I'd done. Let's, let's stop watching less and start doing more. Let's start less talking about other heroes of faith, but become a hero to your grandchildren and your children and, and to your peers. Doing something that people say, I cannot believe they did that. It must be God. So Holy Spirit, God, we want to have a breakthrough, Lord God. Hallelujah. Amen. Mm -hmm. As I was listening to Bob's message, the last part, I feel like the Lord was impressing that, that we are on the winning side. Yes. That if we thought that the battle is on the losing side, that our side is the losing side, there is no hope, there is no power, there is no ability, no matter how much we try, our team is losing. But this is exactly the opposite of what the Lord is has given us. The victory is already won and we are on the winning side. So don't trust our perspective, our even our experiences. The Bible says that we call on the rock that is higher than us. So our experiences, our perspective, even though it may seem that it is that the world seems to be the winning side but it is not this is the faith that we have in Christ and that we are supposed to move forward so come at this time that it is not our own individual strength but because we're on the team that is winning we are the, in the war that is, is um, moving forward advancing the kingdom of God is advancing in this world, and we are on that team. We are the victorious ones. So it is not our own individual strength, because I know that sometimes uh, we can say, oh, it's, it's because it's Pastor O that he has all those miraculous things happening to him. No, this is a principle. It's a spiritual principle that Jesus has showed us and told us that you can do more than I can through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is the very thing that as we position ourselves that we can 
We can become victorious in whatever thing that the Lord has called us. So at this time, why don't we cry out to the Lord? Lord, here I am. Lord, use me for your kingdom advancement in this world. Whatever it is, the gift that you have given us, the whatever it is, the spiritual knowledge and wisdom and knowledge that, that we are given from the Lord, that we'll use this for God's kingdom. So why don't we just come to the Lord at this time and let's just pray and make a, make a prayer of commitment. Let's pray. So Father, we thank you. circumstances of our life, Lord. We don't want to defend anymore, only. Father, healing and deliverance comes prelude to the abundant life that you want to give us. So, Father, we pray, Lord, that we'll never stop at just healing. We'll not just stop and being good enough. For you said, come and hear that your soul may live, that we may live to the fullest. So Lord, we commit ourselves to you at this time. Father, we give you our, our life, our whole being. Will you accept it? And we cast our net and you promised us that we'll be no longer fisher of fish, but fisher of men. And so we give you all the glory at this time. So Father, we thank you. We give you glory and thanks for what you are doing in our midst. Be with our Catalyst family, Lord, as we move forward. Speak to us, minister to us. God, anoint us, for we are weak. We cannot do this on our own. We admit our weakness, Lord. Would you come and empower us, heal us, touch us, that we'll live a life full of serving you with no regret. We thank you. We praise you. Give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.